ang kwechok. Ang chunun chunun ka hamto ka chunun ka ni tei pisa maka tamna ka ni tei ang biat pui tamna ka sadap e chan tan bat ni chop ka chip pita ni dao le tanam reung song song pisa sun pi dai le nda prik ni nang pu dai chan tan top dai sa pri nya ka lam chi sa mna ka lu trei sa kol pu ti la ri ka pi sa tan pi bot ta mien a bot ta mien pi ki nang bok kol ni ang jibra ka hon chui nya chou rum nang nong ka chan maka sa mna ka prik ni ส้มกรุบลงปะเทียนสำหรับสัปนาคาสตาร์ทได้ซอนท่าเหมือนจับไก่เปียซาดังดาวในไงนี้ลามจี้ก็สมควรเคยหากรุบพิกีแตงอ้อในเรื่องกระไดนี้มีนวัตเมียนดอนไลท์ลูกนวลชี้มีนวัตเมียนเดิมตกคงครุ่นขังกราวซาสัปนาคานี่ดอนโลกสนาซ้อมและบังสัตมีนวัตเมียนไหลตัวปีเหมือนตบสัปนาคาในไงนี้ดิคัดและบังสัตบอกลูกนวลชี้บ้านปะโกดอกลามจี้รุ่ยหอยสมอคุณลงปะเทียนอคุณชี้ตะบงนี้อ้อยแม่สำหรับเดือนสำหรับส้มรึเปล่าจุดจับจอดนุ่นเชี่ยจีมุนทันอังยิบเรบันตะตัวลิขัดสมเล็บบังเซตโจรวมสามนาคาได้ต่อขนมปุ๊บสามนาคานี่ระบบจุดจับจอดนุ่นเชี่ยจอดทั้งไงจีมาเผยปีใครมีตัวนายชนามปีปอนดอมเปิลได้เป็นเจ้าท่าได้ก่อนเมียปัญหาสกปรกเพียบชื่อกบาชื่อจึงแก้มันในกุยยูบ้านมันไอพิจองอารมณ์มันยูนั่งนำไปเมียนลัดตะเพียบโจรวมสามนาคาในไงขังมกอเมียมเซตตะเพียบรวมสมเล็บบังเซตโจรวมนั่งเมียนวัดตะเมียนได้ต่อขนมปุ๊บสามนาคาได้ทั้งไงจีมาเผยปีใคบานเคยกำลังให้เป็นนักสกปรกเพียบจนจะเจ้านุ่นจี้ได้เพื่อลังได้กรุ๊ปเป็นประจำก้าเป็นนักเพียบบาทแทนตัวสกปรกเพียบจนจะเจ้าในอวตารก็จะทำงานจีนมาเผยปีใครมีตัวนายชนะไปปอนดับบุ๋มเปิลบานกับทั้งก้อนพิจารณาเพียบสกปรกเพียบบาทลูกนุ่นจี้ในทางนี้ท้าสถานเพียบตัวตื้อหนึ่งโน้ตธรรมดาแต่ก่อนเมนการชื่อจึงจับในภายในกังเกะครั้งในปีหลังก็อยู่หนึ่งบานดอลอนุสาท้าสมัยอังยิมได้อันยัดเอาลูกนุ่นเชี่ยโจรวมตามด้านกิจการกาสัมนาคาพิมันตุมวยทัดกรามซาสัมนาคานี่ไอเลมูลธานี่หนึ่งโยงตามบัตรปัญญาในประเทศไปเสมือพรามในประเทศเตยขนองอวตารก้ออองยิมเรอันนี้ยาดเอาจุนจับจอดนุ่นเชี่ยโจรวมตามด้านกิจการกาสัมนาคาพิจมง่ายพิมันตุมคมครูนมวยทัดกรามซาสัมนาคานี่ตามเยอะปกติสอตุ้มรับเยอะเป็นสัมนาคาเป็นมวยไทยนี่ปกติบอกเลิกสัตว์ในสอตุ้มจอบประปอนสอตุ้มสำหรับจุนจับจอดนุ่นเชี่ยไอโจรวมตามด้านกิจการกาสัมนาคาพิจมง่ายขนมลองเปื่อยในกิจการกาสัมนาคาสำหรับไงนี่เชี่ยวต่อตอนนี้อเมริกาเราเรียกจุนตือสาปเรียงยาดำไปมันต่อถือเดชนาทานตอบระบบขลุ่นกุญแจนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้งโลกรัฐบาลนี้ไปสู่การเลือกตั้ง Extrajudicial execution that took place throughout the country, including the security centers, cooperatives, and work sites charged in this case. But the Nunchia defense, in particular, has claimed that they have rewritten history by uh, explaining their version of how their own party. The CPK was ridden with factions intent upon overthrowing Paul Pot Nunchi and Sampan. The center center that these engaged in attempts to overthrow the rule. In addition, your honors, to being irrelevant legally to the charges, Nunchi's version of history. Is simply untrue. It's the same fake history that the Khmer Rouge tried to sell to the world at the time of their crimes. That they tried to sell to their own people, explain to their own people their bloody rule to justify it. Nunchi is simply untrue. It's 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 simply untrue.
what they cite as supposedly evidence of these attempts, we'll see that it is without basis. It's based on illogical speculation, and in many cases, it's based on torture, on confessions obtained by torturing people. As I said yesterday, there's absolutely no reason legally for the prosecution to deny resistance because it would have no effect. And if there had been resistance, there would be no reason for anyone or more attempts within the party to overthrow the regime. There would be no reason for anyone to deny it. If you look at uh, other instances where people have lived through horrible oppressive regimes, such as, such as the Nazi occupation of Europe, you don't find years later that people who resisted are afraid to speak of it. Just the opposite. What you find is in some cases, people who actually were collaborating with the regime suddenly claim that they were resisting it. But let's look at the kind of evidence that Munchia cites in his arguments, but particularly in his brief. And if you look at his brief, he places great emphasis on a person who didn't testify, evidence that was not admitted. And I simply, Your Honor, don't have time to go through the reasoning behind the chamber for not admitting evidence. It's a very good reasoning that the public can find that in those written decisions. But they talk a lot about witness number one, who they said was interviewed by Ket Samba didn't testify in this case. I want to talk about why they claim that this is a witness that's so important to showing these attempts to overthrow the regime. Witness number one, we don't know the name. The persons who interviewed them refused to give us the name of witness number one. We don't know who it was. But Nun, but Let's look at a few things this person says, and I think anyone who judges it objectively will say that witness number one's version is wholly incredible. First of all, this is a person who claims he was imprisoned in tool slang without explaining how he survived that experience, although he claims he was part of a plot against Pol Pot and was imprisoned in tool slang. Somehow, he survived. Part of his explanation of his experience in Tulslang shows absolutely he's lying about that. One of the things he says is that in Tulslang, the regime planted agents among prisoners. We've talked to, we've had evidence from Deutsch, from interrogators, from others who worked at Tulslang. There's no evidence that any of the regime ever planted agents among prisoners. Given the absolute horrendous, life-threatening conditions of anyone imprisoned at Tulslang, shackled 24 hours a day, no one, no agents would be among the prisoners. But the main uh, piece of evidence that Nunchia cites in his brief and in his oral arguments is he says, witness one, in May 1975, just a month after the victory of the Khmer Rouge, the capture of Phnom Penh, attended a meeting in Phnom Penh, a secret meeting, he says, called it, of 300 300 cadre, he said, from every zone except the southwest. That would include zones that always remained extremely loyal to the regime. And he says, from all of the ministries, among, and that this meeting was plotting against Pol Pot. A secret meeting of 300 people in the middle of Phnom Penh supposedly plotting against Pol Pot. It's simply incredible. And who does he say list among the uh, attendees of this meeting? He meant Lis Chun Chun, who was the, um, you know, one of the famous three brothers, long-time loyal supporters of the Khmer Rouge. They remained so even after they lo lost power. He was the 
head, the Minister of Health, the head of the health section, he was Paul Potts' personal doctor. According to Witness 1, he was at this meeting openly plotting a rebellion against Pol Pot. Who else does he say attended the meeting? Ying Tari, the Minister of Social Affairs, the wife of Ying Tari, Pol Pot's sister-in-law. And this is absolutely absurd evidence. What else does Witness 1 say, which of course the defense ignores in the brief in the oral argument? At one point when he's asked if Nun Chia attended meetings, he said, Nun Chia worked with Lon Nol. So does the defense want us to believe that, that Nun Chia was actually working with the Lon Nol regime? So the witness they were lying upon actually paints Nun Chia as one of the traitors. The next witness, again, that didn't testify, is someone that's named in the book by Tet Samba and Junior Chan. And in that book, it's called Chan Savu. Now, the chamber attempted to call this person as a witness, could not be located, but there was someone with a similar name who apparently had been interviewed by a foreigner. And Shia says that this is probably the same person, and we certainly agree that there's reason to believe that that's likely. Named Chan Samu. But the witness unit spoke to this person twice. And first, they read to the person the version of what he supposedly had told Tetsamba, which printed in behind the killing fields. And he said, that wasn't true. Then they went back, as your honors instructed them to do, and read from these transcripts that Lemkin had provided, where it talked about Chan Savu for this witness three attending meetings were supposedly plotting against Pol Pot and naming various people. And Chan Samut said he didn't even know these people and he'd never been to those meetings. So this kind of evidence doesn't help Nguyen Chia at all. And actually, if you look at what this person said in these interview transcripts provided by Nguyen they absolutely contradict Nguyen Chia's case. Nguyen Chia has tried to claim all the crimes at Trapang Tamar uh, were by Ru Nim, who had a plan to make the regime fail, to starve the people, to make the regime look bad. That itself doesn't make much sense how, if you're doing a revolt, you would try to get the people to be against you. But if you look at the transcript provided by Lemkin, what it actually says, according to Witness 3, is that Ru Nim planned first, quote, the psychology war with people we had to be cold without smashing. Punishment, no matter they were wrong, we would not smash or punish them. He said we had to be cold to make them love us. So, Witness number three, this supposedly Chan Savut, was contradicting completely Nguyen Chia's case, saying that Ru Nim's plan was to treat the people very well, unlike the center's policy, not to smash and to make the people love us. Now, of the witnesses that were named by Tetsambat or in the Lemkin transcripts, the chamber was able to find one of them called Chil Chuan. And he testified. He absolutely contradicted everything that was written about his supposed involvement in coups against the regime. His evidence was so damaging to Nguyen Chia that Nguyen Chia took the position that this is the wrong person. This is not the person Tetsambat interviewed. 
But we actually had videotape of Chiu Chuan sitting next to Tet Samba, part of the additional material from the enemies of the people in a video conference with victims in the United States in Long Beach. Chiu Chuan was the person that talked to Tet Samba. And in the book, Behind the Killing Fields, uh, the book says, Chiu Chuan said in an interview, I was very sorry our plan was not successful. What does Nun Chia say to try to explain that? He says, Tet Sambat does not speak English. Well, this is rather strange since they put great emphasis on what Robert Lemkin could supposedly say, who doesn't speak Khmer and said all he learned from these interviews, the interviews were translated to him by Tet Sambat. So they're saying that Lemkin relied upon a person who didn't speak English at all. And then we go through what Nun Chea claims were various coup attempts. And please, let's look a little bit at the evidence behind what they claim they have proven in their history, the fake history of these coup attempts. Besides the May 75 meeting I talked about, I think the second coup attempt they talked about is an explosion in 1976 at an ammo dump in Siem Reap. Your Honours know from the evidence that DK Radio at the time blamed the United States said that this was a bombing by American planes. And various other experts or analysts have speculated that it was a bombing by possibly Thai airplanes or Vietnamese airplanes. What doesn't make any sense at all is Nguyen Chia's new claim. Well, I mean, they started this claim during the regime as part of the justification for their killing. Uh, what doesn't make sense is why would they say this was a plot by Koi to overthrow the regime because the ammo dump was in an area of his influence. Your Honours, why would Koi if he's planning to overthrow the central government in Phnom Penh, blow up his own ammo dump? It makes no sense at all. If you're, if you're planning to attack the regime, you blow up the regime's ammunition and you attack Phnom Penh. But Nguyen Chia claims now that Khoi Thun was a Vietnamese agent, that this was part of a Vietnamese plot. It's interesting then to look at what Nguyen Chia said to Tet Sambat. And there's, there's a section in that book where Nguyen Chia is talking about the various people that he, the regime killed. And among those is a section called the Friends, those he killed among his friends. And Khoi Thun is in that section. What does Nguyen Chia say about Khoi Thun? It says, quote, according to Nguyen Chia, this is on page 108 behind the killing fields. According to Nguyen Chia, he's talking about during the Civil War, Khoi Thun's men were arresting Vietnamese soldiers who brought goods to Cambodia, which created tension in an already strained situation. Nguyen Chia told Tet Sambat, Khoi Thun, quote, he was trying to make us and Vietnam become enemies. So we see that Nguyen Chia now, again, contradictory versions of his history, his fake history. He told Tet Sambat, Nguyen Chia, uh, excuse me, Khoi Thun, was trying to make the DK, the Khmer Rouge, and Vietnamese enemies. Now he's saying Khoi Thun was a Vietnamese agent. What's the third incident that Nguyen Chia's fake history says was a coup attempt? This is a good one. This is what re when we heard the thunder yesterday, uh, I was reminded of this. Nguyen Chia talks about the fact that at, at about 4.30 in the morning on uh, the 2nd of April, 1976, Apparently, a grenade exploded behind the royal palace. A single grenade tossed against an outside wall or exploded next to an outside wall in the dead of night 
knew no one. With no one injured, no apparent target for that grenade. What sense does that make that that was a coup attempt? Now, some poor soldier named Yim Sabah was arrested for that, taken to S-21, and according to Nguyen Chea's defense, not mistreated, they claim, not mistreated. We know how people were treated in S-21. And he just, on his own, without any mistreatment, confessed to being involved for years and years in a conspiracy against the regime, naming others. That simply makes no sense at all. This whole incident of the grenade against the palace wall in the middle of the night with no target being a coup attempt just shows the regime's attempts to distort history, to spread paranoia, to justify killings. Now another interesting witness relied upon very heavily in the Nguyen Chia's arguments is the testimony of Sam Hong, who was from Division 310. Evidence that's simply not credible and it'll take me a little bit of time, I just want to remind you about the history of his evidence. Sam Horn originally was interviewed by D.C. Camp. In that interview, first of all, he said he was a battalion commander. Now when he came to court, it turned out he said he claimed only to be a platoon commander. So apparently he greatly exaggerated in his D.C. Camp interview his rank and his importance in the Khmer Rouge movement. Also, it's interesting, in his DC camp interview, he gives details about fighting in Vietnam, quite chilling details about his own involvement in fighting in Vietnam. And he's asked by DC CAM if his troops purposely burned down Vietnamese houses. And he answered, and I quote, yes, we burned them down. We never let them stay safe. These Vietnamese houses were built next to each other. It was so easy for us. We just set house on fire and it spread to all the rest. He added even more details about his battles in Vietnam. He claimed that they captured three Vietnamese civilians. And when asked about that, he gave DC Cam these details. He said, quote, they were normal people, like villagers. We just had to say that we had arrested UN soldiers, or enemy, UN, and so in fact they were civilians, such as farmers with small houses like our people here. However, they were accused of being UN soldiers and forced to confess that they were UN soldiers during interrogation. <coughs> what did Excuse me. What did Sam Hong say about Vietnam when he came to court and testified under oath here? He said he never was in Vietnam. He said he never even fought on the Vietnamese battlefront. So apparently he was telling war stories that simply weren't true to DC camp. Now, what about his involvement in in, uh, in, uh, one more incident interesting from his uh, statement in DC camp in his testimony where Sam Hong exaggerated his own importance. He told DC camp that when he was in Division 310, which at that time was a center, excuse me, a northern division that became part of the center army, he said, quote, I was then always with our Samdek Prime Minister. And he confirmed to DC Cam he meant Prime Minister Hun Sen. He told DC Cam Hun Sen was the deputy commander of Division 310. Again, a center division that had previously belonged to the Northern Zone. But, Your Honors, we know from the evidence, defense knows, and they even brought this up during Sam Hong's testimony. The deputy commander of Division 310 was Vong, V-O-E-U-N-G. 
We know also that he was eventually arrested and executed at S21. He's number 13594 on the OCIJ list. And as the defense has repeatedly acknowledged throughout the trial, the evidence is that Hun Sen wasn't in the northern zone. He served in the early years of the DK regime in the, during the civil war in the eastern zone. So what we can see from Sam Hon's testimony and statement at DC camp is that he greatly exaggerated his rank. He greatly exaggerated his battlefield experience, and he exaggerated or lied about his association with the Prime Minister, or simply was very, very confused. But what did he say to the DC CAM about resistance to the regime? First, when he was asked about the regime, he told DC CAM this, I knew this regime clearly. However, I could not escape or resist. He went on to say, I never forgot about Pol Pot regime. And from day to day, I tell my children and grandchildren that they have to be firmly against such a regime and to prevent it from happening again in Cambodia. Now, it was only near the end of his interview, after he made this statement about the need to resist such regimes, that he then claimed the following. He said, on his Division 310 commander was right to resist such a regime. And then he went on to claim that, oh, he himself had been ordered by Ohm to transport weapons from where they were around Phnom Penh, where he was based around Phnom Penh, to Kampong Cham. He said to be used to attack Phnom Penh, the radio station in the airport. Now, what sense does that make? If a division based in Phnom Penh is planning a coup to be implemented by an attack on Phnom Penh, why would they then send their weapons to Kampong Cham? Especially since Kampong Cham at that time was the base of Kepok, loyal DK, bloody commander. It makes no sense at all. Now, when he came and testified, in his direct examination, he was asked about by the prosecution about Ong. And he said he knew nothing about on collaborating with any enemies of the DK regime. And he said, quote, on his political tendency or whatever, we didn't have the knowledge of that. He testified under oath, quote, I never received any direct order from him, meaning on. That was at 10.06 in the day he testified. Sam Hon did tell us something that we know from many other witnesses. After On was arrested and taken to S21, his confession was broadcast to all of his troops. It was common knowledge. Now, Your Honor, there are many second-hand reports by soldiers and even by refugees where they said they heard about resistance or plots in the DK regime. But that we should hardly be surprised about that when the regime was constantly claiming and telling people that there were plots against it, that traitors had been arrested, that attempts to uh, kill Pol Pot had been evaded. So there's nothing surprising about the regime's propaganda having some effect and people simply repeating it. Civil Party's lawyer asked Sam Hon again about his role in the regime, and he answered the following just before 2 p.m. He said, quote, I was committed to serve the army, and as for Hon, I did not know whether he had any plan to betray Angkor. So then why is the defense placing such heavy reliance on him? Because after repeatedly claimed, testifying under oath, he had absolutely no knowledge of any plots by Ong, and never received a direct order from Ong. Defense counsel then read back to him 
this statement he gave at the end of his interview to DC Cam about getting an order from on and transporting weapons about his heroic resistance against Pol Pot. And he suddenly adopted that and said, yes, that's what he did. So Sam on is a, if that's the best witness the defense can come up with, it indicates how weak these claims are. His story is simply not credible. You know, at one point during the testimony of Doik, uh, defense counsel put to him various statements of Sam Owen and others from Division 310 about the supposedly 310 plot. And Doik said the following, allow me to be frank.